providing for your family. Just a touch of the hand, precious Jesus, dipped into the oil of the Holy Ghost. It will soothe. Wipe away all my tears It's the anointing that I need most Yes, yes, yes Sweet, sweet, sweet She 
ती दंग रखी God bless you and welcome to the broadcast of the message of the hour. This is Brother Elmar addressing you live from the studios of Radio Easter River in Cape Town, South Africa. May the Lord bless you and may he be with you. For those of you that have just joined us, I want to give you a warm welcome. Welcome to the program and also welcome to the platform. And we're grateful for this platform that has been made available to us so that we can speak to others out there in the community. And may the Lord bless each and every person that was involved in starting this platform and may you continue also to bless them. Now for those of you that have your Bibles ready, you can turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. We shall read, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am chief. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now we're grateful for the Lord for giving us an opportunity this morning to speak in his wonderful name. And the Bible even says that we should redeem the time in Ephesians chapter 5. So we should make an effort, we should make time for God. We are living in a day where many things are so rushed. We are living in a day where things are going at a very fast pace. Even in terms of development, we see technology and other spheres really moving rapidly and things are going fast. But also for the Christian, we see that things are going very fast towards the return of Jesus Christ. And all the Bible prophecies that were mentioned on many broadcasts before, like Matthew 24, Luke 27, Mark chapter 13, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all those prophecies pertaining to the end times or the return of Christ, we have seen them come into fulfillment in our generation. And Jesus even says in Matthew 24 that this generation shall not pass away. So the generation in which these things happen, the generation that will see these things happening, they shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. So we are living at the door. We are living, the time is at hand. As the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, the time is at hand. And because the time is at hand, we should really make an effort when it comes to the things of God. And we should really prepare ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm here this morning to share with you none else than the word of God. Now my words are the words of a man and they will fail. I might say one thing today, another thing tomorrow. My mind can change, my knowledge can increase, but God's knowledge cannot increase because God knows all things. The Bible says in Acts 15 verse 18 that unto God is all his works known from eternity. So he knew exactly what was going to happen even before time started. And even when time started, the Bible says that he knew the end from the beginning. So nothing is hidden from God, but he knows all things. We cannot hide anything from him. And Paul was saying in Romans chapter 1 that he is a debtor both to the circumcision and the uncircumcision. And that is also what I am to you this morning. I'm just a debtor. I owe you and I owe you the truth of God's word. I am not here to compromise on the word of God, but just to tell you the way that it is written. Now Paul was writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he was telling Timothy these words. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And we know that Paul himself was a great sinner. He was a religious, but yet he was a sinner. And he even calls himself the chief of sinners. And Paul was born as a Jew. He was called Saul of Tarsus. And we know that he was part of the religious sect in Judaism called the Pharisees. So Paul was trained in biblical theology, if we can put it that way. He came from the best seminary. The Bible bears record in Acts chapter 5 that he came under the feet of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a great teacher of the law. So he was somebody that was learned in the Bible. And Paul was a great religious person, full of zeal for God. But it was the same Paul that was persecuting the church of God. And it was getting letters to get them arrested and to get them killed. And many times it can so happen that people can be religious but people can still be lost as it was with the case of St. Paul and people can be zealous but they can still be wrong 
we see this with Cain and Abel from the very beginning. How did Cain was religious and how did he worship? He also brought a sacrifice unto God, but God rejected his sacrifice. And after God rejected his sacrifice, as religious as he was, we see him killing his own brother Abel. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, why did he kill him? Because his works were evil. The Bible even calls him that he was of that wicked one. And in John chapter 8, we see Jesus Christ addressing the Pharisees, these religious leaders, these Jewish people that were uh, learned in the scriptures and that were leading the people. And Jesus was even telling them in John chapter 8 that they were of their father, the devil. So yes, it is possible that people can be religious and they can perform all these rituals and ceremonies and yet they can be lost and without God. But it takes a personal experience with God. It takes a personal relationship with God to make you right with God. And that is what happened in the life of Paul. We see he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He was on his mission once again, full of zeal, trying to do God a service without it being his will. Yes, that is what he was thinking he was doing. And there were many such people even in Bible days. Jesus even said in John chapter 15 that there will come a time that people that will kill his disciples will think that they are rendering a service to God. And it is possible that people can try to do God a service without it being his will. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 6, how did David sent forth to collect the ark of God and how did they were having a great revival and even dancing around the ark. But we see that David did not consult the Levites. He didn't go God's provided way of doing things. And God ordained it in the Bible that only the Levites were to carry the ark and the ark contained the word of God. So it is only those that are chosen to bear the word that should be bearing the word. It's not for everyone to preach. It is not for everyone to teach. It is not for everyone to be a bearer of the word of God. And we see David overlooking God's word and bypassing it. And instead of consulting the Levites, the priests, he was consulting other people and they brought in the ark. And we see there was a man that touched the ark, a man that was not a Levite. And because he did this, God struck him. And we see this entire thing being ruined because they went outside of God's will. So God has a certain way that he wants things to be conducted. And if we go outside of that way that he wants things to be conducted, then we find ourselves in trouble and so it was with Paul he was trying to do God a service he thought he was doing God a service but in the same time he was actually persecuting God and he was persecuting the Christians under his impression he was fighting people but we see when Jesus reacted in Acts chapter 9 we see Jesus telling Saul why do you persecute me so Jesus was actually being persecuted. So as you do unto the Christian, you're actually doing unto Christ. So he was persecuting the body and then the head responded. Just as it is with the natural body. If somebody hits you on your body, it's not your body that will respond, but it will be your head that will respond. It will be your mouth that will speak. And so it is with the body of Christ, which is the Christians. If you persecute the body, the head will respond. And so it was in the life of St. Paul. Before he became Paul, when he was still Saul, we see him persecuting the body of Christ, but then the head of the body, which is Christ himself, responded and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And we see that, that Saul had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. He had a personal encounter with Jesus himself. And the Bible says it was a great light that was shining around Paul. It is that same light that led the children of Israel out of the wilderness, in, uh, throughout the wilderness from the land of Egypt. The Bible said by day it was a pillar of cloud and by night it was a pillar of fire. And that pillar of fire was lightening the way. We know that back then, about three, 4,000 years ago, there was not electricity as we have it in today's time. So when it became night, it was completely dark, except for the light of the sun and the, uh, the moon and the stars that were shining upon the earth. But God manifested himself in the pillar of fire, which was a great shining light. And it was this pillar of fire that was leading the way throughout the darkness, throughout the wilderness. And that same pillar of fire, that same great bright light is Jesus. And Jesus appeared unto, unto Saul in Acts chapter 9 in the form of that great light as the pillar of fire. The Bible even says in John 8 verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light 
of the world. And then first John chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says God is light. Yes, Paul even said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that God inhabits or God dwells in a great light that no man can approach. So he is that great bright light and he appeared unto Paul in that great bright light. And after Paul had this personal encounter with Jesus, we see him being completely changed. His heart was changed, his mind was changed, his life was changed, everything was changed. We see even his eyesight was changed. The light was so bright that it completely struck him blind. And we see him at the, having to go to a disciple by the name of Ananias. And Ananias had to pray for him. And then it was like peels falling off someone's eyes. And then Paul could see again. So this encounter with Jesus completely changed. It even changed the way that Paul saw things. And once you have a personal encounter with Christ, everything changes. Even your walk changes. The Bible speaks of a man by the name of Jacob in the Old Testament. And he had an encounter with God in Genesis 32, where God appeared unto him in the form of an angel. And the Bible says that Jacob wrestled with the angel. And as he was wrestling with the angel, we see him being struck by the angel on his hip. And after the angel struck him on his hip, Jacob no longer could walk as he used to walk. And spiritually speaking, once you have an encounter with God, also your walk changes. You cannot walk any more the way you used to walk. The life that you used to live, you cannot live that life anymore. Once you have met Jesus, once you've had a personal, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And so it was in the life of of saint paul hallelujah he had a personal encounter with jesus christ and that is what people need today they need a personal encounter with jesus christ and they need to come into a personal relationship with jesus christ they need to accept jesus christ as their own personal savior regardless of how religious you are You might have grown up in church all your life. Your parents might have been religious all their life. Even your grandparents might have been religious all their life. But the Bible clearly says that God only has sons and daughters. He doesn't have grandsons and granddaughters. Regardless of how religious our ancestors were that, that was on earth before us, Their walk with God is an individual affair, just as our walk with God is an individual affair. We cannot enter into heaven's gates by claiming my father was a preacher or my grandfather was a preacher. No, but we need to bow our knees and make a personal confession of our own sins. We need to have a personal experience with God ourselves. There is no shortcut to heaven. The Bible speaks about two ways. The one is the narrow way. Few there be that is find on the, found on that way. And then we have the broad way, the way that leads unto destruction. And there are many that is found upon that way. And the Bible even says in Proverbs 14 verse 12 that there is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof is death. So many are on that way that seems right. And the Bible even says, as a man think of in his heart, so easy. And many times people think they are right, and then it can turn out to not be that way. So we need to have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul, after he had this personal encounter with Jesus Christ, he could really write confidently about Jesus Christ. And it is only once we have become Christians ourselves, then we can share with boldness and gladness what Christianity is about. And Paul was summarizing it in this first epistle to Timothy. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said it is a faithful saying. And if it's a faithful saying, it means it cannot be broken. It is reliable. As we were speaking on Thursday about the faithful witness, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and this is also a faithful saying so it is something that you can build your hopes upon you can build your future upon because it cannot be broken jesus even says in john chapter 10 the scripture cannot be broken and whenever god speaks something it is a faithful saying it is something that cannot be broken it is something that is irrevocable something that cannot be changed because god's mind is perfect and when he speaks something it is perfect god does not need to alter his words god doesn't 
nie tipex on a razor to change what he said, but what God said is established and it is perfect. The Bible says in Matthew 24 verse 35 that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. So God's word is fast. It stands fast. God's word is like a rock. It is solid. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 that if we listen to the words of Jesus, if we obey him, then we shall be like those whose houses are built upon the rock. And when the storms come, that house will still be standing. But those who just hear and do not obey, they are like those that build their houses upon sand, sinking sand. And when the storms come, that entire house will crash and fall to pieces. But God's word is solid. It is faithful. It is the rock. It is the solid rock itself. It is faithful. It is a faithful saying. And when God says something, we can build upon it. It's better to stand upon the word of God than to stand in heaven. Why? Because heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall never pass away. God's word is unshakable, it is un- unmovable, and you can stand fast upon what God said. Why? Because God cannot lie. The Bible says in Numbers 23 verse 19 that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that it should repent him. And the Bible also says in Romans 3 verse 4 let God be true and every man be a liar. So when God speaks, he speaks the truth. His word is reliable. His word is faithful. His word is unshakable and unmovable and this unshakable word of God says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief Christ came to save sinners and that is what the gospel is all about Jesus was even saying in the book of Matthew chapter 9 that those who are sick or though that are healthy, they do not need the doctor, but those that are sick. And Jesus says, I came not to call righteous unto repentance, but I came to call sinners unto repentance. That is why Jesus came into this world as a savior to save the sinners, to save the lost. And even at his birth in Matthew chapter 1, it was already announced that his name should be called Jesus. And it is he that shall save his people from their sin so his name in itself already spoke about his destiny and therefore it's also important what we name our children back in bible days we see that names had meanings and even in today's time names had meanings and people gave their children names with meanings connected to them and it was even believed that as you name a child so that child shall be and we can take many examples throughout the bible where people were given names, and sometimes God even changed their names, starting right with Abram in the Bible. And we see that the name Abram meant father, and God changed it from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations, because God made a promise that if the stars of heaven could be numbered and the sand on the sea could also be numbered, so his descendants would be numbered. God made a promise that he would make him a father of many nations. God even changed his wife's name Sarai to Sarah. We see even with Paul, his name was Saul, but God changed it to Paul. We see the apostle Simon, that God changed his name to Peter. So names are really prophetic and they can determine a person's destiny as you are named so you shall be and with jesus we see he had the specific name his name should be called jesus and the bible says because it is he that will save his people from their sins and the name jesus in the hebrew language it means yashua and yashua means god the savior so if you were calling jesus on his name if you were saying in hebrew yashua or even today if you say jesus you are actually calling him god the savior and that is exactly what he is he is god the savior because in isaiah 7 verse 14 it was predicted that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel being interpreted means God with us. So even the name of Jesus alone tells us exactly who he is and what he came to do for us. He came to save us. He came into the world to save sinners. And even if you read in John chapter 4, the Bible says that he is the savior 
of the world. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the one that came to save us. Now we're going to take a break shortly. We're going to listen to that song again, Sweet Anointing. After listening to that song, we'll return to the second part of the, this uh, broadcast today, speaking about the faithful saying, God bless you. Just a touch of the hand, precious Jesus, dipped into the oil of heart, the Holy Ghost. It will soothe. Wipe away all my tears It's the anointing that I need most Yes, yes, yes Sweet, sweet, sweet
God bless you and welcome back to the broadcast of the message of the hour. May the Lord bless you and may he be with you. Yes, that song is a great blessing to each and every one of us, speaking about the sweet anointing. Hallelujah. And that is what we all need this morning is the touch of God. And even when it comes to the Bible, we need the touch of God. You know, the Bible is a book that is written by God. The Bible says in First Timothy or First Peter chapter 1, that uh, the men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that is how the Bible was written, because they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible has 40 different authors, but they were all inspired by one spirit. And for you to understand the book, you need to speak to the author. If you took out the book from the library or you bought a book at the uh, local bookstore, you might read the book and there might be things in the book that you don't understand. But if you would arrange for a meeting, an appointment with the author of the book. The author would really explain to you what he meant in the book. And that is how it is with the Bible. The Bible is really like a great love letter. And for you to understand the Bible, you first need to be in love with the author of the Bible. And once you become in love with the author of the Bible and you are in a relationship with him, then you can also understand the Bible much better. But if you look at the Bible with eyes of hatred, eyes of judgment, eyes of preconceived ideas, uh, if you look at the Bible from that point of view, you will stumble a lot over the word of God. If, but if you look at the Bible with the eyes of faith, that is really where you can draw your blessing from. If you look at it and see it not just as pages that were written thousands of years ago, but if you look at it with the eyes of this is God speaking to me, then it changes a whole lot of things for you. So the Bible says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So yes, we said the word of God is solid. It's like the rock. It is faithful. And it says it's worthy of all acceptation. So you can really accept it. You can embrace it. You can take what God says. You can take him at his word. And God wants us to take him at his word. Even in Malachi chapter 3, God says, and prove me herein. God wants us to prove him. God wants us to give him a chance, give him a try, and see if this is the truth, and see if this is that, that what God has spoken to us. And it is worthy of all acceptation. Now, the word of God is not just for a certain group of people, but it is for all people. It is worthy to be accepted also by all people. Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, where he tells his disciples that they should go into all the world and they should make disciples of all nations. Even Mark chapter 16, Jesus says in verse 15, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be condemned. So yes, the word of God is for all creatures and it is for all nations. God's word is for all people. And it is worthy to be accepted, hallelujah, that Christ Jesus came into the world to die for sinners. Now, many times people stumble and they still wonder. They walk in circles wondering who Jesus is. And Jesus was even asking his disciples this question in Matthew 16, verse 13. Who does the people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that you are Elijah, some say that you are John the Baptist, some say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this unto you. So what Peter had was a revelation. It was revealed unto him who Jesus was. And today many people are still walking in circles trying to figure out who Jesus was. But it is very plain who Jesus was. Jesus even says, I and the Father are one. Some of the disciples still wondered and they said in John 14, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus said, Philip, I've been so long with you and you've not known me. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Hallelujah. Jesus is the Father manifested in the flesh. The Father was in the Son. Hallelujah. And if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father also. If you have the Son, you have the Father also. You cannot say that you have the Father, but then you deny the Son. If you have the Son of God, then you have God 
God Himself. Hallelujah. The Bible even says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come into the world to give us understanding that we might know the true God, and we are in the true God, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God. Hallelujah. Let me read that for you. And we know that the Son of God is come and have given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, it cannot be written more plain like that. So that is who Jesus Christ is. That is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that He is God Himself manifested in the flesh, that the Father was in the Son. Now, that is one circle that people are still walking around. The other thing is that people can still not figure out is that why did Jesus come into this world? And we can allow Jesus to even speak himself and give testimony of why he came into this world. And we know that Jesus came for the great task of reconciling man back to God, of laying down his life and shedding his blood so that he can unite us back to the Father. Yes, Jesus even stood in front of Pontius Pilate and he said, this is why I was born for this reason, for this purpose, to bear witness of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And all the apostles gave testimony about this, why Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world as the supreme sacrifice that was made on the cross of Calvary so that our sins could be blotted out and be forgiven. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He had to shed his blood. Now his blood was not just any blood, but the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 verse 19, that it was precious blood. It was not just the blood of another lamb or another goat or another bull or another turtle dove, but it was the blood of God himself. It was divine blood. It was holy blood. It was pure blood. Acts chapter 20 verse 28, the Bible says that God has redeemed the church by his own blood. So the blood of Jesus was not Jewish blood. It was not Gentile blood. It was not the blood of a man. It was not the blood of an animal, but it was divine blood in its origin. And it took the blood of God himself to take away our sins and to pay the ultimate price. The Bible even says about Christ being our great high priest in Hebrews 9. It says that he entered into the sanctuary with his own blood to atone for our sins. He went right into the presence of God with his own blood. Yes, that is the holy blood, the holy blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And he had to shed his blood because it is only blood that could atone. It was only blood that could bring down the wrath of God, that could bring down the condemnation. We see even in Egypt, when God led Israel out of Egypt, God told them to slaughter a, a lamb. A lamb without spot and blemish, uh, about a year old, firstborn lamb, and they had to take the blood and apply it to the door. And when God would move through the land of Egypt, all the houses where he saw the blood, he would pass. He says in Exodus 12 verse 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. But the houses that had not the blood, that is where judgment struck. And today it is the same thing. You need to come under the blood if you want to escape judgment. You need to accept the lamb that was slain. The Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. You read that in Revelation 13 verse 8, also Revelation 17 verse 8. The Bible makes it very plain also in John 1 verse 29. It says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And also the vision in heaven, Revelation chapter 5, the Bible says there stood a lamb as though he had been slain right in the midst of the throne and of the 24 elders. And only the lamb was found worthy to take the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So Jesus over and over is being referred to as the lamb. And as the lamb, he is the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And that is why he came into the world to save sinners with his own precious blood. 
And this is what the gospel is all about. And if you want to be saved, you need to come under the blood, you, which means you need to believe, put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross, and then also you need to confess your sins so that they go under the blood. Sins that are under the blood, sins that are blotted out, that can no longer be remembered, that are really removed from God's memory. God does not recognize that sin anymore. But if sin goes out, or it's not covered with the blood, such a sin will be condemned. But yes, Christ came to save us from our sins. The Bible says in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then he says in verse 17 that God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He that believes in him is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already. So if you want to escape judgment and condemnation, you need to believe on Jesus Christ. You need to accept him as your own personal savior. And all that believe in him shall receive forgiveness of sins. All that believe in Jesus Christ shall be redeemed. All that believe in Jesus Christ, hallelujah, they shall receive eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is found only in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. If we go to the book of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ. In verse 14, it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And then we go over to Chapter 5 and verse 11. Let's make it verse 10. He that believe on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things if I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And there we have it very clear. The record is given, the witness, the testimony that eternal life is in Jesus Christ. And if you want to have eternal life, you must have Jesus Christ in your life because he is the source of eternal life. Only in him and through him are you able to access God. Jesus says in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So yes, that sounds quite straight, but that is the biblical truth. There's only one way to get to God, and that is the way that God came to us. And God came to us in Christ. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is the mediator between God and man. He is the one that made the breach. He is the one that gives us access directly into the presence of the Father. He is the one that takes us directly into glory. No one else, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Jesus only. Hallelujah. Now, many are tuned in this morning that have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. Now, throughout the years, there have been many such, even as it was with St. Paul, there have been people that have been religious. They grew up in church. They went to Sunday school. Their parents were religious. Their grandparents were religious. They belonged to maybe some of the greatest denominations upon the earth and some of the best churches that you can find out there with the best Bible teachings and so forth. But you can have all of that. There is nothing wrong with that. But it is a personal, personal, individual affair between you and God. Unless you accept what is written in the Bible, it profits you nothing. Jesus says this question in Matthew 16 verse 24. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his soul? Now you might have all the world behind you. You might have all the wealth, the riches, the education, and all that stuff. Nothing wrong with that. All those things make our life just a bit more easier upon the earth. If we have wealth or education or whatever, and I'm not against that. But if we don't have Jesus, then it is all in vain at the end of the day. 
we need to have Jesus Christ in our life as our own personal Savior. We need to repent of our sins and we need to accept Jesus Christ. That is a plain biblical truth. The Bible speaks about repentance and repentance is what the Bible is all about. The word repent means to turn, to turn around. And this is what the message of the Bible is about. It is about turning man that has become lost back to God. We come into this world, the Bible says in Isaiah 51, we come into this world speaking lies. We are born in sin, shape, and in iniquity. But we need somebody to guide us. We need somebody to save us. We need somebody to lead us. And that is what the Bible does. It leads us back to God. It points us back to God. It makes us to turn around in our tracks and to look for Him. Now it is actually Him that is looking for us. And when He starts looking for you, that is what pricks your heart to start looking for Him. And it is so important, it is so important that we must repent. The Bible says in Matthew 4 verse 17 that Jesus himself was preaching and he was saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There was a man sent before Jesus who was the forerunner of the first coming of Christ. And his name was John the Baptist. And in Matthew 3 verse 2, even John said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see all the apostles, all the prophets, they were preaching the same thing and they were telling people to repent from their iniquity and from their evil ways. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this is a, the biblical message. It is a message of repentance. And this is what Jesus even said, that he did not come to, to call a righteous people, but to call sinners unto repentance. Now, repentance doesn't necessarily mean that you're clapping your hands all the time, you're jumping up and down. That doesn't mean uh, that you have repented. Even people that have nothing to do with Jesus can do that also. But repentance starts in the heart. It comes with a broken heart, and it comes with an honest heart that acknowledges, that admits that it has sinned against God, that it has violated God's laws, and that it is not worthy of God's mercy. And this, this is where God's grace takes over. When somebody admits that he or she is wrong, and that he or she, and she needs God to help them, to save them, and this is where God touches. Now, God will not cast you out. God will not cast you away. Jesus says that no man can come to me I, I except the Father that has, has sent me draws him first. And I will, I will never cast him out that comes to me. God is more willing to save you than you are willing to be saved. God is more willing to help you than you are willing to be helped. Now, if there's any out there in the radio land, those of you, I cannot see you, you cannot see me. But God sees you and God knows you. You can close your eyes you can just bow your head wherever you are, bow your knees and just pray with me. Dear Lord, I come to you in the matchless name of Jesus. I acknowledge that I have sinned, that I am born into the world as a sinner, and without you, I'm without hope, without mercy, I'm lost. But I pray that you will just take a hold of my heart this morning and that you will touch me. Lord, that you will save me and redeem me from the body of this death and that you will just set me free because whoever the Son has set free shall be free indeed. I pray, Lord, that you will just purify me of all iniquity and that you will fill me with your Spirit. I pray that you will just lead me and guide me and give me revelation and understanding in your Word and give me a willing heart and spirit to serve you. Save me, Lord, and I will be saved. In Jesus' holy name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer with us this morning and you believed in what you've prayed, then you have taken the first step into the right direction to follow Jesus Christ. Now, if there's anyone that has really prayed that prayer this morning with a sincere heart and they would like to continue to learn more about Jesus and to follow him, you can contact me on 078 721 078-721-9191. If there's anyone that wants to know more about what I am preaching, if there is anyone that would like to learn more about the message of the hour, you can also contact me on the same number. If there's any pastors and preachers that would like me to come and share the word with the congregations, you're also more than welcome to contact me. And may the Lord God just bless you for that. Now, as I go off the air, we're going to listen again to that song, Sweet Anointing. 
And God bless you and be with you until the next time. Pray for me as I also pray for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a touch of the hand, precious Jesus, dipped into the oil of the Holy Ghost. It will soothe. Wipe away all my tears It's the anointing that I need most Yes, yes, yes Sweet, sweet, sweet Sweet, sweet, sweet.